how risky is it to reopen schools? Dr. Daria, and many of you have asked me this question, and you know I'm an emergency room doctor, but I'm also a mom. My kids are three and six. This question matters personally to me. And I'm also working with a bunch of schools to help them make these decisions, and I know parents needed to have this information. But what's been really bothering me is that it seems like the camps are in very extremes. You have some people who say, we're definitely opening regardless, and you have some people say, we're not gonna open. You know what I need? I know that you need, I know we all need to be in more of a science-based, sanity-driven center. And the only way we can do that is by looking at the data. How much of a risk is it? And that way we can know how much of a risk is it, to whom, and what do we need to do? What are the riskiest scenarios so we can know how to best mitigate those risks and whatever it takes to do that? So I knew you wanted this. So I've done a separate video on what schools should be doing and I'll do more on that. But this, this video, I just wanted to focus on risk for you to have this and I wanted to share some numbers. So for those of you who like the numbers, who like the data, this one is for you. It's no spin, it is just data I am sharing with you. So three big factors we have to look at. First is how likely are children to get COVID? Number two is how likely are they to become severely ill from COVID? And number three is how likely are they to spread COVID? Those are the three I'm gonna be looking at today and sharing with you the best data that I could find. A lot of this comes from a report that just came out last week from Massachusetts General Hospital, but then a lot of it is, some of it's from the CDC. I got out my Excel and was crunching some numbers myself and then just other reviews that I have seen. So just kind of the best evidence that I could share with you as of you know, today's date, so July 15th. Question number one, how likely are kiddos to get COVID? I think overall, the data shows that our children are less likely than adults to get COVID, and with the exception of children under the age of one who I consider medically vulnerable, with the exception of them, the younger a child is, the less likely they seem to be getting COVID. In the United States, kids under the age of 18 make up around 22% of the population, but they've made up less than 2% of the positive testing population. Emphasis on the testing, because we aren't testing kids as, as much as adults, so that's an important caveat. Now, of course, you could say that this might be because of lockdown. Children haven't been out of their house, so they haven't been exposed as much. I think that could play some part in it, but I don't think it explains the entire bit. So if you look at the other data, China shows that children from modeling are about half as likely to get COVID. Iceland, where they did a lot of testing, found that children under 10 were about half as likely to get COVID. And in Vaux, Italy, where they had a big outbreak, they said that children under 10 didn't have any infections in that age group, and ages 11 to 20 were about half as likely as adults. Looking at other data out of Wuhan, out of New York City, household contacts of people who had known tested positive, and even out of Israel, all support that when you look at a household, the adults are more likely to be infected by another adult or by anybody in that household than the children are. Question number two is how likely are children to be severely affected by COVID? If there's any silver lining in this, it's that children are less likely to be severely affected by COVID than adults. Let's just look really quickly at who's most at risk. So when it comes to COVID, there is the COVID effect, and then there's also the effect of the multi-inflammatory system condition, MISC. So COVID, it does appear for children that they are less likely to end up in the ICU and to need ventilator support or any other critical care. It also does seem that those children most at risk of severe complications from COVID are those with significant medical comorbidities. When we look at children in the ICU, about 50% of them, anywhere from 50 to 70% of them, do have medical comorbidities. Of course, that does mean that anywhere from 50 to 30 to 50% of them don't. So it's really important to note that, that, that all children need to be protected from this, but our medically vulnerable are, are the most susceptible. When it comes to MISC, this is still a very rare condition. It's still something that I think we know the least about. And it does seem that MISC seems to uh, potentially uh, attack all groups of children, not necessarily just those who have chronic medical conditions. There may be a higher rate amongst children who are in minorities, but I think we have to be aware of this, that MISC seems to be affecting potentially children from all groups. So MISC is something that we really need to be watching very closely to understand who is most susceptible and why. There's two other statistics I want to share with you. One is the number 30. 30 is a number of children under the age of 15 who have died in the United States from COVID since February 1st, as of July 8th, according to the CDC. 
Now, it appears that most of those children did have chronic medical conditions, but we don't have data on all of them, and 30 is, is not a zero number. We need to be aware of that number. The other number to look at is 0.02%. You may have heard that 0.02% is the mortality rate potentially said by some people for co from COVID. It's important to couch that. That 0.02% is baking in that they're trying to look at all the children who might have COVID that we've never diagnosed, never tested. We're trying to capture all of them. So that's really the lowest mortality rate you would expect. That may seem small. But if you think about it, we have 74 million children in the United States under the age of 18. If you say that 60% of them have to get COVID to get herd immunity with a 0.02% mortality rate, that's 9,000 deaths. So 30, 9,000, those numbers are not zero. So we need to take the information that children are less likely to be severely affected by COVID and that's reassuring, but we need to be aware of those other numbers because it means that we cannot be cavalier. And it means that we really need to take all the protective steps that we can to protect those children, not only those children that are medically vulnerable, but to protect all of our children so that we can decrease the rate of illness and avoid any needless infection and protect everybody. Question number three, how likely are children to spread COVID? Overall, it seems that children are less likely to spread COVID than adults, and the younger a child is, probably the less, even less likely they are to spread it. So that's good. Now, let's look at the numbers. Now, avian flu, in a contrast, it seemed that from studies, children were the ones who spread the disease about 50% of the time. Now contrast that with what we're seeing with COVID where children are the ones who spread the disease only about 8% of the time. Now, is that due to lockdown? It could be in part, but so let's look at other places where we can see the effect where lockdown wasn't a factor. So France, and again, these are all anecdotes, but it still gives us information at least someplace to start. So France had a case of one infected student, had went to three different schools and was in contact with 112 other students. They had no confirmed cases. Ireland, before the closure, had a situation where there were three students and three staff who were infected with the virus, had contact with about 900 students, 100 staff, no infections. And Australia had nine students and nine staff infected at one school, had contact with 730 students and 128 staff. Two students were infected, but no staff. Really important to look at those to show, again, infections are not impossible, they do happen, but again, much less likely than we are seeing from adult situations. Let's look at the daycares, because I think this provides really interesting illustrations as well, because even though we've been in lockdown, a lot of essential worker parents have needed to have their children in childcare. So there's two good illustrations. There's a New York Department of Education that said that during this entire pandemic, they were taking care of 10,000 kids at about 170 different sites. Similarly, the Arizona YMCA said they had about 40,000 kids. Both of them said they had situations where there was one person who had a positive COVID COVID result, but they quickly shut it down and they had no instances of outbreaks. Contrast that with what we're seeing from some of the daycares in Texas, where we're seeing at least 1,600 cases, um, and looking at that. So, of course, to put that in context, there are 12,000 daycare centers in Texas, and about 1,000 of them have had positive cases. So that's still less than 10%, but 1,600 cases. So it's still important to notice. And it looks like all the daycares in Texas, or, or many of them, were operating without strict rules for distancing or, and masking. So is the difference there just the lack of distancing and masking and other protection protective effects. I think we really need to know. It's hard to know, it's hard to get the data from Texas, what's happening, but I think we can look at those as examples of perhaps what to do correctly, perhaps how not to do it. One last thing that was important, I thought was some information out of um, Denmark, which said how at risk are teachers. They looked at teachers after being back at school for 10 weeks and they found that their chances of turning positive or getting a positive test from COVID were about a quarter of what it is for somebody working in healthcare and were more on par with people working in hotels and restaurants, places like that. Which means that for teachers, the risk for them is no, not necessarily any higher 
than anybody else who's having to go to work and protect themselves accordingly. So really interesting information. Why are children less likely to spread the virus? We don't know for sure. I mean, anybody who has children knows that they go and they cough and they sneeze and they rub their boogers on each themselves and they rub them on each other. I have a three-year-old and he loves to come up to me, mommy, 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 gets in my face and he does one of three things. He either uh, deliberately passes gas, he burps, or he does that cough where he goes, <coughs> right in my face. So why are they less likely to spread COVID when we know they're little bioterrorist weapons in so many ways? We don't know for sure. One is possibly that it seems that children may be less capable of making aerosols, which means they're less likely to be able to spray COVID in an aerosol form, which makes, it, makes them less contagious. So there's your summary. In terms of catching COVID, children seem to catch COVID only about a third to a half as much as adults. In terms of getting severe infection, children definitely get severe infection much less likely than adults, but it's not a zero number. We have to be very cognizant about that. Uh, protect those children who need extra protection. Protect all our children and make sure we're being very vigilant about doing that for all of our children. And thirdly, children definitely seem to spread COVID a lot less than adults. So three kind of reassuring data points. Again, it's early. Again, we are going to have to watch. What does this mean? What does this mean in the end? Um, and I'll do more videos on this, but for many of many parents watching, this means to me that if you live in an area that has a low prevalence of COVID, maybe a place that has never had high COVID or has had it, but has gone through it, has gotten it under control, and you have those positivity rates somewhere around 5% or less, then if you have the low prevalence and you have a school that you think is taking seriously and doing the various protective steps that they should be doing and you know, and distancing and masking and a variety of other steps at cohorting smaller class size, then I think in those situations, assuming you have a healthy child and, and don't have vulnerable medical people living in the home, I think those parents can feel comfortable letting their children go back to school. Now, if you don't have that situation, if you don't have a situation where prevalence is low and the school is doing the right protective effects, then I think we need to look at that. Because if the problem is that prevalence is too high, then we've got to clean up our communities. We have a few more weeks to do it, and this is imperative. Because if we don't clean up our communities and our communities have rampant COVID, there's nothing that our schools can do to keep from having COVID come in, walk in through their doors. Second thing is that the schools have to be able to do these protective effects. It's on us as parents, it's on us as citizens to make sure that our schools are capable of protecting our children, our teachers and staff, and our community. Let me know what questions you have. Let me know what comments or what still concerns you or, conf or confuses you. I will be doing more videos on this and the appropriate steps that schools should take and what parents should take. But I really just wanted you to right now know the risks and know how to start framing these decisions in your mind. Please share this. Please share this information with a parent who's worried and struggling to make these decisions, with somebody at a school who's trying to make these decisions for their school, or with teachers and staff who are wondering about, can they go back to school safely? Because the more we have the right information, the more we can make the smartest decisions to protect our children, to protect the teachers and staff, to protect our communities, not just for now, but for decades to come. I'm Dr. Daria, stay well, and I'll talk to you soon.